You guys got your Bibles? Get your Bibles out, get a hold of them. Come on, get them in your hands. And if you have the ability, stand to your feet. Let's honor the Lord and let's pray. Father, today we thank you, Lord, for our nation. God, as we celebrate the anniversary of the birth of our nation, God, we're so grateful that we can come into this place openly and freely because men and women stood up for what they believed, God, and they went after you, Lord God. They chased after you, God. We thank you, God, that you've given us this nation that's a great nation, God, greatest nation on the planet, I believe, Lord, because of the blessings of God upon us, Lord. May we continue to grow in godliness. May our nation repent of their wicked ways, God, and turn to you, Lord. May there be great awakenings and great revivals across our land, God. Raise up wise and godly leadership who will lead us in the direction of the goodness of God. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for what's ahead of us. God, we pray today, Lord, as we open up your word, God, that you would open it up to us. God, today, truly, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. We acknowledge today that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. So be welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. And we thank you in advance for that. God, we will do our part. We'll give our interest and our attention. God, will rule out distractions and look to you. Lord, we know you'll do your part getting the word of God to come alive on the inside of us as the word is sown to our lives. Lord, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel. God, we bless our Baptist brothers and sisters, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostal brothers and sisters, Lord. We thank you, God, for Calvary Chapel, for Harvest, God, for the, the Way and Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God, all the great churches that are out there, the Victory and Foursquare denominations, God, Assemblies of God and Church of God in Christ. Lord, all the great churches, God, our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, if they're lifting up your name, preaching your truth, God, we bless them as you would bless us. Also, God, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. God, we ask that you encourage them, strengthen them, bless them, guide them, protect them, Lord, and deliver them from the hand of their enemies, God. May they endure to the end to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. As we've been in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, we've Learn some things about faith. There's no other way that you're going to live life except by faith. In fact, you cannot be even pleasing to God except that you live a life of faith. Because the Bible says that we should be a people who seek after God. And there's no other way to please God except by faith. Because those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so Hebrews 11 chapter has introduced us to some great and mighty men and women. Men and women who have done great and mighty things. In fact, many scholars call it the hall of faith, you know, kind of like the hall of fame here on the earth. This is the hall of faith that these people show us something and, and give us encouragement in our life to live a life of faith. We come to Hebrews 11 chapter, verse number 32, and it's almost as if he starts to wrap up his thoughts about these great and mighty men and women of God. Hebrews 11 chapter, starting in verse number 32, he says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. Also, of David and Samuel and the prophets. Now, let me tell you something. God is very intentional about what he says. It's not like the Holy Spirit was speaking about all this stuff and all of a sudden he realized what time it was and he told the man that was writing this down, oh, hold on a second, uh, wait, uh, I didn't realize what time it is. I gotta get back to heaven, so you need to wrap this up. You know, we've been going too long here. That's not what's going on. God is intentional about what he says. God is very strategic and very specific, and he doesn't mix words. So while the writer may have said, you know what, I've been going on for a long time, and, and I've got to wrap this thing up, what the Holy Spirit really is doing, he's showing us something by the lives that are being listed here. Very interesting to me, as you look at these names, there's the first four names, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, were all men who were judges and deliverers of the nation of Israel before they had a king. And then he mentions David and Samuel. Samuel was the last judge, but he was really the great prophet in Israel. And he was the one who, when Israel came and asked for a king, instituted and anointed the first king of Israel. Now, the first king was Saul. Saul started out great. He started out good. He started out wonderful. And yet Saul ended up in disobedience and rebellion and ended up failing. But his replacement was a man after God's own heart, a man by the name of King David. David was the greatest king Israel had ever known. In fact, 
out of David's lineage comes Jesus, the Messiah, who is now king forever, seated on the throne and ruling over the house of David. Wow, what a great man. And as I look at these men that are listed here, and then it goes on to say, and all the prophets. As I look at this list of names, I notice that there's a common thread amongst all of them, especially as we look at these first four, these four judges of Israel, and including David and Samuel. I notice that these are men who all did great and mighty things for the Lord. They all had great victories. They all had great things that took place in their lifetime. God used them to do awesome and mighty miracles here on the earth. And yet when I look at all of these guys, I also notice something else. I also notice that they had flaws, that they had failures, that there were things that they went through, trials and temptations. Some of them are glaring. Some of them messed up big time, and God records it in the Scripture for thousands of years that people are looking at their failures and their mistakes. Now, that tells me something, and it gives me comfort, because if God can use these guys with all their failures and all their flaws, with all their mess-ups and their screw-ups, and God can still use them to do great and mighty things on the earth, bring about great victories on the planet, then God can use you. And God can use me. Come on, can somebody say amen to that? But it doesn't happen because of these guys. It happens because they operated in faith. But there was a certain type of faith that I want to talk to you about. I want to start a new series today called Humble Faith. This is part number one of Humble Faith. The first name that we witness here is a man by the name of Gideon. Gideon. Now, I want to make a statement. I want to put it up on the overheads for you. Despite our failures and flaws... We can move forward with God and do great things through humble faith. Despite our failures and our flaws, we can move forward with God and do great things through humble faith, just like we see all of these great men did. David, Jephthah, Samuel, Samson, Gideon that we're going to take a look at today. The common thread was their failures and their flaws, and yet God still chose to use them. And all of us could look at our lives and we could say, well, you know what? I'm flawed. I, I failed. I messed up. I, I, I really uh, am not that smart. And I, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes throughout my lifetime. And yet God wants to use you to bring about his will on the planet. But he's going to do it through humble faith. Now, we know what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. But what is humility? See, there's a lot of humble that's out there when we're talking about humility, really. And, and you know this church, there's no bull. There's only the truth here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And so today, let me tell you what humility really is. Is humility, well, woe is me. I'm the lowest of the low, and don't look at me, and, and you know, that sort of thing. See, that, see, that's what the world thinks about humility. You know, I was just kind of chuckling because I remembered that, that uh, children's book, Charlotte's Web, where they had the humble pig. You remember that? And, and that's how we think we've we got to be if we're, we're going to be humble. We need to be like that pig wallowing in the mud, and we're really low to the ground, and, and, and I'm, just, I'm just a worm, and, and, and that sort of a thing. And yet, that's a bunch of bull. That's really not what humility is, because when I look in the Bible, I see these great, mighty deliverers of Israel, and they weren't wallowing around in the mud. They weren't self-abasing. They weren't doing any of that kind of stuff. No, what were they doing? They were depending on God. Humility is simply this, depending on God. That's all humility is, that we would lower ourselves and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and depend on him. God, if you don't get involved, this is not going to happen. God, if you don't come through, it's not going to work. Why? Because God, I'm flawed. God, I've failed. But God, you've never failed. And God, you are perfect in all of your ways. And therefore, we can do it. Why? Because I'm depending on you, God. I'm believing you, God, for something great and mighty to happen. As we look at the life of Gideon, we see that Gideon was a, a great man, and he was a deliverer and a judge of Israel. Now, I want to turn to Judges, the sixth chapter. And while you turn there, let me give you some of the backstory. Okay, Judges chapter number six. Judges was a time in Israel after the Exodus. They had been delivered from Egypt. They had come out with miracles, signs, and wonders with a great deliverance. The Lord parts the Red Sea, and then he parts the Jordan. He takes them in, and Joshua, with the children of Israel, has a great conquest. He divvies up the land and delivers it out to the different tribes. And then after a period of time, just like Moses had said, they got comfortable. They forgot about the miracles. They forgot about what God did for them. They forgot about their bondage and their slavery. They forgot about the wandering in the wilderness and the things that happen when we disobey God. 
And so they got comfortable. They were enjoying their food. They were enjoying their life. They were enjoying their wealth. And they kind of kicked back and rode on their laurels for a while. And eventually, what happened was, was that the nations around them started to creep in. And the worship of gods, small g, little g, not the god we serve, the big g god, but the little g gods, started to worship and bow down before idols, started to put up high places where they burned incense to the stars and to the moon and to the sun and all that sort of a thing, started doing things that were detestable in God's sight with their idol worship. And so God started to remove his hand of favor and blessing and protection off of their lives and would raise up other nations around them. And the Bible says that they would come in and that they would start to oppress the nation of Israel to the point where they would be driven back to the one true God. And they would cry out to God and say, God, deliver us. God, remember your covenant. God, we are your people. We are the apple of your eye. And so God would raise up a judge. He would raise up a deliverer for them. And while that judge or that deliverer was alive, they would experience peace and they would be following the ways of the Lord. But when that judge would die, after a period of time, they would fall back into that cycle of worshiping idols. And it was a cycle that went on. You can see it all throughout the book of Judges. It's just a circle that would happen. They'd have these great high points and this great deliverance. And God would come through and then they would forget God. And they would be oppressed and they would be uh, crying out to the Lord God. And then finally God would raise up that judge and it would just go around and around and around. Here in Judges, the sixth chapter, we find that the same thing has happened. And at this time, it happens to be the Moabites that are coming against the children of Israel. Anytime the children of Israel would have a harvest, their crops would come up, they would start to go and they would start to harvest the crops and they'd be picking up whatever it was and the Moabite raiders would come in and they would just wipe out the nation of Israel and they would steal all of their goods, they would steal all of their harvest and then they would take off. And so they had to hide in caves, they didn't have any weapons, they didn't have anything that they could defend themselves with, they didn't have a lot of might, a lot of strength and God had delivered them into the hands of the Moabites. It's at this time that we find that something takes place. The angel of the Lord comes up on the scene, and you'll notice in your Bible that it's a capital A, angel of the Lord. Really, this is an appearance of Jesus before he comes in the flesh. This is what uh, is called a Christophany, okay? So when you see the angel of the Lord with a capital letter, that's Jesus showing up pre-incarnation or pre-coming in the flesh, all right? Y'all good? Y'all got that? Okay, Judges chapter number 6, verse number 11 says this. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah. Not Oprah Winfrey, Oprah. Okay, it was a place. And it says, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press. Now a wine press, for those of you who don't know what that was, that was a place where they, it was a big bowl kind of a thing, right? And it was a big uh, bowl that they would put all the grapes in and then they would do the, the, you know, they would stomp the grapes and as they stomped the grapes, the, the juice would flow down to the bottom and then it had a little funnel that came out and they would fill up their wineskins with that. It was a wine press. So here's Gideon and he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, I don't know if you know this, okay? I know we're not an agrarian society any longer. We don't do too much with, uh, you know, agriculture and that sort of a thing, but don't you thresh wheat on the threshing floor, right? Doesn't that make sense? You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You put grapes and you press grapes into wine in the wine press. So Gideon's doing the right thing. He's harvesting his crop and, and he's working, but he's doing it in the wrong place. He's in the wine press. See, threshing wheat They'd have a pitchfork and they would take that and they would put it into a stack of wheat and they would throw it up into the air and the wind would blow across that and it would blow away all the lighter elements of the wheat. That was called the chaff. And what would fall down was the precious grains that they wanted. That was their harvest. And so as they threw it up and they would keep doing that until all of the chaff had blown away and then all they had was their harvested wheat. So Gideon's trying to do the right thing, but he's in the wrong place. Why was he doing that? Look at what it says. It says, he threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. In other words, he knew that these guys came in every time there was a harvest and they would steal everything. So he says, they're not going to steal my wheat. I'm going to hide it from them. Now it's at this place, verse number 12, it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now we got to stop right there and talk about this for a second. Because when I look at that statement, I say, God, you got to be kidding me. This guy is threshing wheat in a wine press because he's afraid that the Moabites are going to come and steal it. That is not a mighty man of valor. If I would have showed up as the angel of the Lord, I would have said, you big chicken, what are you doing in the wine press? This can't be working. There's no wind. It's not going to work. What are you doing, dummy? Get out of here. Go be a man and go thresh wheat on the threshing floor and take it like a man, right? The Moabites show up, I'll deliver you or something like that, but not God. Not God. Look at what God says. He says to him, 
The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. See, we may not see things in the natural. We may not understand that or view ourselves as such in the natural, and yet God is a God who speaks those things that be not as if they were, and he starts to declare the calling of God and the purpose of God into Gideon's life. Today, God's going to speak to you. He's going to deliver his word to you. He's going to encourage you. You're going to hear things about yourself that you didn't see in the natural, but God is going to start declaring some things into your life because you have a calling, you have a purpose, and God has a plan for your life. Gideon responds in verse number 13, much like we would. Look at what he says. Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So Gideon looks around at the natural surroundings, and he says, I hear what you're saying, but if God's forced, then what's going on? What happened to all the miracles? What happened? I have heard about these things. See, he had faith to believe that God is a God who could do great and mighty things, and yet in the natural, he didn't see them. So he starts questioning and saying, why? Why is this going on? What's happening? Look at how the Lord responds to him in the next verse. Verse number 14, it says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours. Now stop right there. What might? He just questioned you. This is the dude that's threshing wheat in the wine press. And yet you say, Go in this might of yours. What might did God see? What is God talking about? Well, obviously, when I look at the statement of Gideon, Gideon is not happy with current circumstances. Gideon's looking around and he's saying, this ain't right. Something's wrong. If God is great and mighty, then why are we oppressed? See, he was bugged by the situation. He, he was not content to just sit still. That's why he's threshing wheat. He's out there working. God saw something on his life. He saw something in his heart that Gideon would not sit still. Gideon was a man of action. And therefore, he says, go in this might of you. You're bugged about this? Let's go do something about this. See, we cannot just sit in the status quo. We cannot stay the same. God is calling us up. God wants us to be equipped to do the great and mighty works, but we cannot sit still. We can't sit in the same spot. And so he says, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? But verse 15, so he said to him, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Look at, the, look at how he views himself. Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. See, in the natural, Gideon had no qualifications. In the natural, Gideon did not come from the right part of town. We would have said Gideon was from, you know, not just San Bernardino, maybe he's from the wrong side of the tracks. Some of you guys say, I he probably lived next to me in Muscoy, or maybe he was over there in Bloomington, or maybe he was in Colton, or, or Rialto, or something like that. You know, it didn't come from Ukaipa or Redlands, where all those snobs live, right? And, and, and I can say that because I live in Redlands. So anyways, but, but Gideon came from the wrong side of the tracks. He came from the wrong side of town. He, he didn't come from the strongest. He wasn't a part of, you know, he wasn't like the tall basketball players. He wasn't like the big buff football players. He, he was the littlest guy. He was the runt of the litter. And yet, God is choosing him to use him. And in the natural, isn't it like God to take people from a broken city? See, Los Angeles, with all of its problems, took a look at us and said, hey, they're broken. They had an article that came out about San Bernardino and about the meth problems that are here called broken, talking about our city. My goodness, when Los Angeles is looking down their nose at you, something's wrong. And it's a bankrupt city, one of two in California that stayed bankrupt. All sorts of corruption, all sorts of stuff going on. But isn't it like God to say, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose those things that the world would overlook. And I'm going to use you. I'm going to raise you up to do great and mighty, wonderful things. And I'm going to take you and I'm going to use you to send the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Inland Empire and around the world. That's God. Because God gets the glory. God gets the honor because it's got to depend on him. Gideon had no grounds, but the only grounds Gideon did have to deliver Israel was the word that the Lord had given to him and the humble faith that believed God at his word. Look at the next verse, verse number 16. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. See, all that right there, that's all he needed was a word from God. I will be with you. Listen, Jesus Christ said this. He said, surely I'm with you even to the end of the age. Jesus is with you. That's all you need is one word from God to step out in faith and do great and mighty things on the earth. He says, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. God is calling us to great things, church. When we look out, when we look at the life of Gideon, we notice that it wasn't just 
that God said, I'm going to deliver you, and then all of a sudden it was a cakewalk, and he just walks in and tells the Midianites, hey, get out of here, and they leave. No, there was trials ahead of him. There was a battle that he had to fight. In fact, I would encourage you to read Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8 and read about the life of Gideon and what he had to go through. He had his own countrymen hating on him. He had to go through some trials. He had to go through some people turning their back on him. He had to weather different diplomatic things that he had to go through where, where people were mad at him and stuff was happening all around him. And yet, Gideon still did great and mighty things. And sometimes when we hear the word of the Lord, you come into church, you get all built up, and you're ready to take on the world, and then you get out there into the world, and all of a sudden, there's a band of Moabite raiders waiting to take you out, right? And you say, God, this is crazy. I, I thought it was all going to be okay. I thought the preacher told me about faith, and now I'm going to believe God and go out there and take the world, and yet I still got to fight? What's that all about? But we get the wrong ideas about trials. See, trials are not there to stop us. Trials give us the opportunity for faith to be exercised in humility. In other words, when you look out, you cannot win the battle on your own. You can't do it. You're not good enough, not smart enough, not nice enough. You're flawed. You, you failed in the past and things have gone on and you don't qualify in the natural. And yet the trial is not there to stop you. Nothing can stop you when God is on your side. Therefore, what's the purpose of the trial? The trial is the opportunity for faith to be exercised in humility or dependence on God. That's what trials are all about in our lives. I have a question for all of us. Will the church get out of the wine press and take on the battles of life? See, we're doing the right thing, but we're in the wrong place. See, we, we've got everything on the inside. I, I'm building myself up. I, I, I'm doing my thing. I got my church going on. I got my praise on in the car. And, and yet we're hiding in the wine press. And God is calling us out of the wine press to go and win the victory for Jesus Christ. God has called us to the battlefield and he wants us to step out of our comfort zone and God wants us to go on and take on the enemy. And today God's going to equip you and me to do that. See, the story of Gideon shows us what to do when we have a word to step out in faith on. If we'll do these things that we see Gideon did, we will have the results that Gideon had. First thing is this, is we've got to humble ourselves to his calling. God is calling us. God has a purpose for our lives. God has a plan for our life. But we have to humble ourselves to his calling. Let's take a look at Gideon's calling. There in Judges chapter 6, this time drop down to verse number 25. Gideon continued that conversation with the Lord. He made a sacrifice. The Lord showed himself to Gideon. Gideon realized he was talking to God and he didn't die. And he said, therefore, God is peace. He had a revelation of God, Jehovah Shalom. And he declared that the Lord is peace. And it's in that place. Look at what it says in verse number 25. It says, now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooded image that is beside it. Now, Baal was a false god, little g god, right? Not the big g god we serve, little g god, okay? He was a false god, probably a demonic spirit that they would bow down and they would worship before. And so there was an altar to Baal that Gideon's father had. Now, God is telling him, you need to break down that altar, and as well, there was a wooden image, a carved image beside it. We would think of it like a totem pole, all right? And that was another image. Most of the time, that was to Ashtoreth, which was a, another false god, little g god, and it was a female god, and they would do detestable things in front of these altars and in front of these totem poles. And so God says, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to do this right, and so I need you to get away and break away from the falsehoods of this world. I need you to break away from the altar of your father. In other words, you're up upbringing was a certain way. You were raised a certain way. Your daddy did something a certain way. Your mommy did something a certain way. Maybe you didn't even know your family. You didn't know your parents growing up. And yet your environment was a certain way growing up. There are things socially that are acceptable around you that you are going to have to break from and you're going to have to separate yourself if you're going to do this thing right. Now he doesn't stop there. He goes on. He says, not just break that down, but look at the next verse, verse 26, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. Let's talk about this for a second. God wants to build his worship, his sacrificial obedience into our lives. And God says, I want you to build that altar on this rock. What is the rock? The rock is Jesus Christ, right? After Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus says, I say you are Peter, and upon this rock, the confession of who I am as the Christ, I will build my church. In other words, our lives are built on the foundation. No other foundation can be laid except that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. 
and we are to build our lives and build the worship of our life, what we bow down before, what we serve to God on the rock of Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't stop there. He says, I want you to build it in the proper arrangement. In other words, there's a lot of Christians in American churches that are building their lives on Jesus. They're coming to church. They're doing the church thing on Sunday. They're saying, I'm good with God. And then they're going out there and they're not doing it the right way. They're living one way on Sunday and another way the rest of the week. And God says there is a proper arrangement. You can't do it however you want to do it. This is not whatever we say goes. This is whatever he says goes. And there is a proper arrangement. See, God gives us everything we need for life and godliness here in the word of God. God says there is a way to serve me. I want you to do this and obey my commandments. Well, well what about grace? You know, grace will cover it. The love of God will cover it. We can do whatever we want to do now, right? Wrong. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. In the book of 1 John, I was just reading it last night, it said, this is the love of God that we obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. In other words, God is not trying to hold us down and hold us back from having fun. No, it is fun when you serve God. Life just explodes. Life just opens up. You're so blessed, you don't even know what you should be doing with yourself. You're like, I just can't. I'm blessed. God is so good. I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed. And God says, I need you to build your life in the proper arrangement. Don't, do, don't try and do it the way the world does it. Don't try and do things out there in the, in the world and in society. You, you need to do it the proper arrangement. It might look weird. You might get hated on by some of your friends. Some of your family might be wondering about what's going on in your life. You know, complaining about how much time you start spending in church. And wait, you're giving your money to that church? What are you doing giving your money to church? They never had a complaint when you are giving your money to the drug dealer or when you were giving your money to pornography or when you are giving your money to the bar, when you are giving your money to the club or when you are giving money to, you know, some foolish thing you saw on television. Yeah, go ahead, do that. Right? But don't give your money to church. Why? Because now you're putting your life in the proper arrangement and people aren't going to understand they're going to get mad. It goes on, verse number 26, it says, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. I just love that. Don't you love that? God's like, I want you to take the wooden image, take that totem pole, use that as the wood for the burnt sacrifice. In other words, burn that sucker to ash. I don't want to even see it anymore. That's going to be my sacrifice right there. <laughs> Only one true God, there is no other beside him. And God says, I want you to do this. Verse number 27, so Gideon took men... Ten men from among his servants did as the Lord said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it, by day he did it by night. So Gideon, the man in the wine press, is now the man in the middle of the night doing the will of God. He did it, praise God. He went after it. He was obedient to what the Lord had said to him. But he still had some fear in him, right? But listen, he still accomplished the will of God. Now, sure enough... His dad came out, and the men of the city came out. They saw that the altar was torn down, that the wood was burned in the image, and there was a new altar that was set up there. And the men of the city came to his dad, and they said, we're going to kill your son. He took out the altar of Baal. Now, the dad was smart. The dad was wise. And he says, listen, if Baal has a problem with him tearing down his altar, let Baal kill him. And the men said, well, yeah, you're right. Okay, we'll let it alone. And they took off. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Pretty good dad. At least he was smart in that way. But it's amazing to me. What God is speaking to us through this. What is God saying? God's saying, no excuses. There is no excuse that says, I can't serve the Lord and I can't do what he's called me to do. No, when God has told you to do something, you need to humble yourself to his calling. There's no excuse. Well, I don't want to rock the boat, you know. Everybody's so politically correct these days. We don't want to offend anybody. Listen, the gospel in its nature is offensive, guys. A naked man hanging on a tree that's crucified and dying because I messed up is offensive to my flesh. No one likes that reality. No one wants to stare the Savior God, a perfect God, in the face when he's nailed to a tree because it makes us feel bad. We're going to hurt. We're not going to like it. And it says that as we preach the gospel, it's the stench of death to those who are perishing. In other words, they're going to say, ugh, I don't like that. It is offensive, guys. And yet, it's the truth. And without it, there is no way of salvation. That's why we've got to stop being so politically correct and just tell people the truth. 
Most of you come to this church because we don't patty cake and play games. You like the fact that we tell you the truth. So what makes us think when we walk out of these doors that people out there in the world want us to play games and patty cake? Well, we got to relate, Pastor. You know, I, I got to get their respect first. So, you know, I need to watch the shows and I need to watch the movies and listen to the music so that I can relate with them when I'm talking. That's a bunch of hooey. You need to love them. They will relate to the love of God. You need to tell them the truth because they want to hear the truth. And you need to not sugarcoat it, candy coat it, water it down. You need to give them the potent, pure word of God. Listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're headed for hell, but I love you too much to let you go. Jesus loves you too much, and that's why I went to the cross. And you need to get saved and come to the rock. Come on, somebody. That's just how it needs to be. Get out of the wine press. Whew. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I got to run. You guys, are pre- you guys are saying amen better than the first service. The more you say amen, the longer I preach. So for the next five hours, we're talking about Gideon. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Some of you guys would do it too. That's awesome. Verse 26, look at what it says. It says, for you see your calling, brethren. You've got to humble yourself to his calling. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. How many of you felt wise or mighty or noble before you were called? You felt like you were the bee's knees, right? You were all that and a bag of chips. None of us. None of us. We all knew our flaws. We knew what we looked like when we woke up in the morning. We smelt our own breath and all that kind of, I mean, just, it's not me. Not wise, not noble, not, not mighty. But look at what it says. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put this chain in the wise. Anybody ever feel foolish other than Pastor Dan? Okay, good. I'm in good company today. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Anybody ever felt weak? I know I have. My goodness, I am not qualified to do what I do in this life. God has chosen the weak things. Verse 28, and the base things. I looked up that word base in the, in the Greek. I was shocked. You know what it said? It said from San Bernardino County. It's amazing, isn't it? And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Anybody ever been despised, have people hate on them, turn their back on them? Listen, when you're weak, when you're foolish, when you're despised, when you're base, that puts you in pole position to be used by the power of God if you will humble yourself to his calling. And it says, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. God wants to use us, church, but we got to humble ourselves to his calling. Second thing is this, not only humble ourselves to his calling, but depend on his ability, not on our ability. We're weak. We're despised. We're base. We're from the wrong side of the tracks. We're from the wrong town, from the wrong city, got the wrong last name, got the wrong color skin, uh, got the wrong education, got the wrong looks. And yet God says, I want to use you to do great and mighty things. Who me? Yeah, you. Hiding in the wine press, walking around during the nighttime. But it's got to be dependent on his ability, not on our ability. What's Gideon famous for? You guys know what Gideon's famous for? Anybody know? Shout it out at me. The fleece, right? Gideon is famous for the fleece. Here he comes and he says, God, if I'm going to do this, I got to know it's you. So what does he do? He takes a fleece and he throws it out on the ground and he says, God, if it's you, then I want the, the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry around it. And so he goes to bed that night, he wakes up the next morning and he goes and he grabs that fleece and he could wring the fleece out into a whole bowl of water and the ground was all dry around it. He said, God, that's cool. But I, I just need one more assurance. Just, just give me one more, God. Do me one more, all right? This time, I'm going to throw the fleece out there, God. And if you would, make the ground around it wet and the fleece dry. This next morning, he wakes up. He comes out. The ground is all wet. He picks up the fleece, and it's completely dry. Now, the Bible tells us not to tempt God. So I would encourage you guys, don't throw fleeces out. God, if it's you, God, if you want me to give a dollar in the offering today, I want lightning to come out of the sky and strike Pastor Dan in the leg, you know. <laughs> Don't do that. Do not tempt the Lord your God, okay? I only had one prayer like that one time. I remember I met uh, this beautiful blonde girl here at the Rock Church. I had been invited. I was in a Christian rock and roll band. We came, we played, and I, I, I was introduced to this beautiful girl. In fact, she was the pastor's daughter. 
and she's a gorgeous blonde girl. She, she happens to be sitting over there on the front row. And, and I remember at that time I had prayed. I said, God, I don't want to do, I don't want to be, you know, girl crazy, Lord. I want to seek you. God, my heart is for you. And therefore, Lord, if you want me to be single like the Apostle Paul for the rest of my life, God, I am ready for that calling, God, if that's what you want. And so then I meet this beautiful blonde. I can't get her out of my mind. And I'm going, I rebuke you, Satan. Get, out, get behind me, you know. And, and I just can't get her out of my mind. And I'm thinking, God, this is nuts. I, I was just telling you how pure I wanted to be and how holy and how I'm going to follow you and, and be a eunuch for the kingdom or something like that, you know? And, and so I threw the fleece out. I said, God, I'm going to a concert tomorrow, and if she's there at that concert, I'll take it as a sign from you, thinking, got that one taken care of. She was there, guys. I'm like, all right, I got to marry this girl, I guess. So anyways, we got married, and the rest is history. Don't do that, all right? Don't be throwing fleeces out for the Lord. But remember this same Gideon, this is the guy that was in the wine press. This is the guy that was out there in the middle of the night. This is the guy that had the fleece. And this is the guy also that the Lord had to deal with some things. First thing God dealt with was pride and fear. Gideon sends the word out to the nation. He says, I want you guys to gather to me. I want you guys to come out. I want you guys to fight with me. So an army of 32,000 people shows up. That's pretty good, right? 32,000. Well, that's not too good when you're coming up against hundreds of thousands. So we would have thought, oh, well, you know, God will, God will still do it. God's amazing. God's mighty. God, God can make it happen. But God says, lest Israel say that their own hand has delivered them. Uh, you got too many people with you, Gideon. So I want you to go and I want you to ask whoever's afraid that if they're afraid, they can go home. So Gideon says, all right, God. And so he goes to the army. He says, anybody afraid? Go home. 22,000 people left. I'd have fell out just... But Gideon gets up 10,000 or left, right? That's still a good number, God. Okay, let's go. And God said, nope, you still got too many. And we say, what? See, we'd have been having, God, we need to have a talk over here. This is crazy. And yet, Gideon was just obedient to the word of the Lord. And he didn't depend on his own ability, he depended on God's ability. So God says, I want you to give the guys a drink. Whoever drinks just face in the water, send them packing. Whoever bends down and cups it and then laps it up like a dog, you know, they're the ones that are going to fight for you. Listen, the ones that bent down and lapped, 300. That's it, 300. The rest of them Gideon sent home. And with those 300, God used them to rout the army of Midian. Now, God also had to deal with fear once again because this Gideon, the guy that was in the wine press, the guy that was in the middle of the night, the guy with the fleece, God says, and Gideon, if you're fearful, I want you to go down and just listen into the camp. So he says, I'm going to take a walk, right? He goes down to the edge of the camp, and he starts listening in, and he hears some guys, and the guy says, man, I had this crazy dream last night. I must have ate a bad pizza or something like that, and had this weird dream, and, and, and it was just a bread roll that rolled right into the camp, and it hit the edge of the tent, and the tent just fell down to the ground. The other guy that he's telling the dream to says, well, that's none other than the sword of Gideon. Gideon's like, shoot, yeah, all right, that's my sword. Yeah, let's go, let's do it. So he gets his army together, he gathers them up, and he starts to give them instructions. What's the point of what we're talking about, guys? What are we talking about? Is that we're talking about you have to depend on the ability of God. See, Gideon could not depend on his own power. He couldn't depend on 32,000 men. See, that would be pride, and pride is in opposition to humility. But he also couldn't operate in fear. He couldn't go out there in presumption and say, I'm going to do this. No, he had to operate in faith. He had to have the word of the Lord to step out on because it wasn't Gideon's ability. It was God's ability. Are you there in 1 Corinthians still? Yes. Go to 2 Corinthians right at the end. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 9 and verse number 10. The great apostle, the apostle Paul, this wise man, this Pharisee of Pharisees, born of the right stock, born of the tribe of Benjamin. This guy had it going on. He was taught by the right teachers. He had the right uh, credentials. He had it all going on, and yet he gave it all up for Jesus. Now, we would think this guy was pretty cool. He could do things in the natural, and yet he, he had a problem. He had a thorn that he called in the flesh, something that came against him again and again and again and again, and he's praying and he's pleading with the Lord, take this thing away from me, and look at what God says to him in verse number nine of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, Paul, you can't do it, but I can do it. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. He's not boasting in himself, guys. He's not proud. He's not lifted up. No, I'm going to boast in my infirmities, my weaknesses. Why? So that God can show up and do great and mighty things. Look at the next verse, verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then 
I am strong. Listen, guys, if you ever felt weak, you're a prime candidate for the power of God to be resting on your life. God will show up, but it can't be your ability. It has to be his ability. Last thing for today, I'm going to wrap up with this, is step out in the power of his word. Once you know the calling that God has for you, once you have depended on his ability, dealt with pride, dealt with fear, now it's time to step out in the power of his word. Judges chapter 7, verse number 9, let's look at the word God gave to Gideon. It says, it happened on the same night. When he had the dream, right, the guy had the dream and he, Gideon heard about it. On the same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. Now is the time to get moving on the word of God. So what does Gideon do? Gideon goes and he doesn't give his army swords. He doesn't give them spears. He doesn't give them javelins. He doesn't give them shields. He gives them a torch and a trumpet. And he says, I want you to put a pitcher over the top of the torch so that no one can see the light. But I want you to break up into three companies, and he surrounds the camp in companies, three companies of 100 each. And he says, look at me and do what I do. And there came a time where Gideon took that torch, and he broke the picture off of it, lifted up the light high in the air, and he took out the trumpet, and he blew the trumpet. And it was at that time that they shouted, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And when they did that, they lifted up that light, they broke the picture, lifted up the light, they started to toot the trumpet there, and they started to shout the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon that the whole camp was confused. They all got up out of their sleep, they grabbed their sword, and they just started hacking, and they started slashing, and they started taking out each other. And it was in that time that the 300 men raced in on them and started to take them out, and they started to run. Now, the rest of the nation heard about it, and they said, we're not letting you guys do this on your own. We got to get in on this. And they started to run, and they started to chase them down, and they got their kings, and they cut off their heads, and they brought them back to Gideon. And they routed the army of the Moabites with 300 men because of the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Now, what does that mean? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. See, we think that we need the strength in the natural. I need the money. I need the resource. I need the wisdom. I need the education. I need the strength. No, you need the sword of the Lord and the sword that's in your hand, whatever your name is. See, this is the word of God. This is the sword of the spirit. And when you declare the word, you can step out on the word because it's not only God's sword, it's your sword. And you can move forward and get the victory through Jesus Christ and his word. Charles Spurgeon said, when the truth conquers us, we shall conquer by the truth. What do you believe in God for? What's God speaking to you? What is the word of the Lord on your lips? When the truth has conquered you, when you get it deep down on the inside of your heart, when you humble yourself to his calling, and when you depend on God, not on yourself, then you can step out on his word and declare the sword of the Lord and my sword. God will take care of the rest. You will have the victory in Jesus Christ. Did you guys get the word of the Lord today? Hallelujah. Humble faith. It's going to be a great series. Stick around. Stick around. Great things are ahead of us. I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place. Remember, I'm going to slap you with my Bible if you get up during this time. Stay seated. Your eternal life's at stake. I want to make sure that you don't go to hell, that you go to heaven. Let me love you enough to tell you the truth. Let me get in your face for a second because you've been patty caked with long enough. The world has told you you're okay. Just kind of float through life, do whatever. If it feels good, do it. Maybe well-meaning Christians have told you you don't have to do anything. God loves you so much. The way is broad and open and wide. And yet Jesus didn't say all roads lead to heaven. Did you know that? Jesus never said all roads lead to heaven. We like to say that, all roads lead to heaven. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. People out there in the world, they can do whatever they want to do. We'll all make it there somehow, some way. Listen, guys, that's foolishness. Jesus said there's one way. And he said the road is narrow, and it's hard to find. And Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. I mean, there's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Not your way, not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way or the world's way. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus came and he told us the way to heaven. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. It's that simple. No other way you're going to make it except by being born again. Now, the world out there has tried to define for us what being born again is. They've portrayed it in movies and books and magazines and blogs on the internet as to be some weirdo, goofy, out-of-control Christianity. And yet, nothing could be further from the truth. 
Even though it may be radical, it might be different than what the world sees as proper. Listen, it's not about what they say is the proper arrangement. It's about what God says is the proper arrangement. What does being born again really mean? Well, does it mean going to church? Does it mean being good? Does it mean that you were raised in church? Does it mean that you've done good works? Does it mean that you volunteered at a church or given your money to a charity? No. Because nowhere in the Bible do I see that our good works get us into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible do I see that our church attendance gets us into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible do I see that our upbringing or our region or our nation or our family lines get us into heaven. You can't get to heaven based on any of those things. You can't get to heaven based on your volunteerism or giving money, any of that kind of stuff, because the Bible says, what shall a man give for his soul? Our goodness will always fall short, because the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not going to make it to heaven based on our good deeds, based on our charitable donations, based on our interest or our volunteerism in church. You must be born again. So then what does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just this, to be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If, if I raise my hand and you point and count, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. Let's get over that today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. And yet the devil thinks you're so dumb, he's trying to talk you out of it right now. You're whispering in your ear, you've done enough good, you're fine, you're all right with God. This guy's crazy. Listen, tell that devil, go jump in a fiery lake, you're going on with God today. Will you be embarrassed? Maybe. But even if you are, better than ended up in hell forever and ever. I love you enough today to tell you the truth, not play games. God loves you so much, he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. Now, will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out watching by television, the foyer, or down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, put the burger down. Get ready to get your hand up. This is your time, and this is your moment of salvation. If you're watching online, wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world, get ready to get your hand up. Wherever you're at, come on. This is your time. This is your moment. Who should raise their hand? If you've been a run from God instead of two, God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this? Never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life. I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now if that's you. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. There's two. There's three. There's four. Gotcha. There's five. There's six. There's seven. Gotcha over there. There's seven wise people. Anybody else on this side? Seven, eight in the family room. Nine in the family room. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Who else? Today, anybody else on this side? About 11 or 12 wise people. I got you up there. Thank you. God bless you. I see your hand. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? About 11 or 12 wise people. I want to make sure that you have this opportunity. Check yourself out. Check your heart out. If you don't know if you died right now where you would end up, whether heaven or hell, it's this easy. Make sure today before you leave this place. We are not assured tomorrow. Anybody else real quick? Get your hand up if that's you. No, you need to give God all of your heart. No, you need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? Anybody else? Is there someone up there? Thank you. God bless you. Got you. Up there. Got you over there. God bless you. Who else? Anybody else? Real quick. Just raise it up high when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about a dozen wise people. Hallelujah. All right, those of you that raised your hand, or even if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. Let's not leave during this time. We're trying to get people to come this way. If you go that way, they're going to follow you that way, okay? So I want you guys to be respectful of the move of the Holy Spirit, drawing people to himself. And let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand, if your children raised their hand, or if you should have raised your hand, come on, get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me up front right now. Come on down. Come on down. I surrender all. They're coming, come on. You can come too. I surrender all. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. From the family rooms, if you need to bring your children, they're welcome. Come on, bring them on down. Bring them on down. They're still coming. They're still coming. Hallelujah. Come on, give my hand. You can come too. They're still coming. Come on, there's room for you here at the altar. This is your time. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, step out in faith. The Lord has spoken to you. Now it's time to move. Come on down. Come on down. Wow. Wow. I apparently need to go back to school and learn how to count because there's a whole lot more than 12 up here. This is awesome. Awesome. That's where that, that verse, not many of you wise, are called. That's why God can use a fool, right? To do great and mighty things. God wants to use you. God wants to do great and mighty things in your life. Everybody look up here. Put a smile on your face. This is the best decision of your entire life right here, right now. All right? It's a good thing. Okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Reverend Antonio. He's a good guy, okay? You can call him Tony if you like. Good good guy. Okay, nothing weird goes on. Me and me and Elijah, we're about the weirdest ones up here, okay? Comparing socks and stuff like that. that that's, that's us. He's cool, all right? He's going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to read about when you take it home. Real easy, simple reading. Help find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to introduce you to someone we have here in the church called the Spiritual Personal Trainer. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual Personal Trainer is that person. Come alongside you for a period of time and encourage you in the things of God to help you to build your life in the proper order, like God says. You don't go back serving the ways of the world, serving the devil, any of that kind of stuff, but now you can go on with God and be pleasing to the Lord. You're going to live a great life, got a great life ahead of you. Great things are going to take place in you today. So if you guys will just make a left turn, your friends and family will wait for you. Follow Raven Antonio. Love you, Tony. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today.